Welcome everyone to this Courthouse Steps uh, oral argument webinar. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups uh, here at the Federalist Society. Today, November 2nd, 2021, uh, Election Day here in Virginia, we're covering two cases that were heard yesterday by the Supreme Court, uh, consolidated, Whole Women's Health v. Jackson in the United States versus Texas. Um, we have a great uh, group of professors very knowledgeable about this issue. They're here to go through the cases with us, answer your questions. Um, and a quick note on that, please submit those questions via the chat. You can submit them via Q&A chat or the chat, um, either one. I'm sure you know the functionality, but that's how we'll take the questions when we get to that part of the call. A quick note that expressions of opinion on today's call are those of our experts. Um, so some brief introductions. Of course, you can find their much longer and more distinguished biographies on our website. Um, but for right now, you're not here to hear me talk. So we're joined uh, first by Professor Howard Wasserman. He's professor of law at Florida International University College of Law. Professor Wasserman is going to give an overview of whole women's health. Um, then we'll hear from Professor Stephen Sachs. He's the Antonin Scalia Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. He'll go over U.S. versus Texas. They'll go through the arguments, and then we'll look to you, the audience, for questions. So with that, Professor Wasserman, thanks very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me and, and thank you all for uh, joining us today. Uh, so I'll start with a very brief overview of, of the Texas law, which was uh, enacted it as SB8. Um, and the, the main substantive uh, provision of it is a prohibition on abortions uh, after detection of a fetal heartbeat, uh, which occurs usually around five or six weeks of pregnancy. Um, what made this law different is that the state eliminated any public enforcement of the law, the usual mechanisms for enforcement of, of the law, in favor of exclusive private enforcement. It created a cause of action for any person to sue over a prohibited abortion, regardless of that person, of whether that person had, uh, had suffered any injury. Uh, and it allowed for recovery of, of statutory damages of at least $10,000 per abortion, uh, an injunction to uh, stop further uh, violation of the statute, uh, as well as attorney's fees. And the idea was to use private enforcement in order to uh, uh, in, 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 as, as the new mechanism uh, for uh, trying to stop the conduct that the state wanted to stop. Um, now, the, and the idea behind this was to make pre-enforcement challenges to the law difficult because the normal move of sue the responsible executive branch official, the official charged with enforcing the law, wasn't available. Um, so the whole women's health lawsuit was a lawsuit brought by a combination of doctors and reproductive health providers, as well as advocacy organizations, and they tried to follow the usual path and sue uh, a wide array of, of public officials, including the attorney general and the executive commissioner of the, the State Department of Health Services, the usual defendants um, in, uh, in a pre-enforcement abortion case. Uh, they also sued the heads of the medical, nursing, and other licensing boards, and they sued a class of court clerks and state court judges. Uh, the, um, and, and then finally they sued uh, Mark Dixon, who's the head of the East Texas Right to Life um, as a potential SB8 plaintiff arguing that he was functionally uh, a, state, a state actor. Um, the district court found that all of these were proper defendants. The uh, fifth, the, that decision was appealed. The Fifth Circuit issued a stay of all district court proceedings uh, pending appeal. Uh, at the beginning of September, in the shadow docket decision that drew a lot of attention, the Supreme Court uh, declined to enjoin enforcement of the law 
uh, uh, pending litigation, noting all of the procedural difficulties with the with the case, uh, and then it later uh, granted cert on the questions of whether any of these are proper defendants. Uh, Professor Sachs, thank you. Um, so the. Uh, United States got involved uh, in September after the Supreme Court initially declined to lift the stay uh, that the Fifth Circuit had granted um, in Whole Woman's Health. And it sued the state of Texas in the same district court. It was assigned to the same district judge. And what the United States sought in its complaint uh, was injunctive and declaratory relief against the state. It argued first that the state was violating the 14th Amendment and the Supremacy Clause by uh, allegedly nullifying uh, the rights within its borders, and also was interfering with federal agencies and contractors and so on, who might be providing or obliged to provide abortions within Texas's borders. Um, the United States wanted both declaratory and injunctive relief, essentially preventing Texas from enforcing uh, SB 8 in any way, and also wanted that relief under Rule 65 of the Rules of Civil Procedure to extend to all of Texas's uh, officers, agents, employees, meaning state judges, state court clerks, other um, state officials, and also to all others in active concert or participation with the state, which the U.S. understood as extending to uh, private plaintiffs as well, who would be bringing suit under SB 8. Um, the United States sought a preliminary injunction in district court, which a month later the district court granted, um, and it granted it essentially in full. Um, it restricted the docketing, maintaining, hearing, uh, you know, resolving of SB 8 cases. Basically, anything that goes on in Texas state court involving SB 8 was within the scope of its injunction. Um, and uh, the United States, or sorry, Texas appealed. The Fifth Circuit uh, granted a temporary administrative stay of the district court's preliminary injunction and then further stayed it pending disposition of the Fifth Circuit appeal. And at that point, the United States went to the Supreme Court asking them to lift the Fifth Circuit stay or in the alternative to grant uh, certiorari before judgment. And that's what the Supreme Court did. The Supreme Court uh, granted certiorari limited to one question, namely, could the United States sue in federal court for injunctive declaratory relief against Texas and applying to all of its judges, clerks, private uh, plaintiffs, et cetera. And so those were the questions that were before the court uh, before yesterday's argument. Uh, so now back to Professor Wasson. So Whole Woman's Health was up first. Um, and much to my surprise, uh, a lot of the court seemed very receptive to the plaintiff's arguments. And it's hard to read tea leaves, but seemed inclined to uh, find that the plaintiffs had uh, found a proper defendant and could uh, uh, proceed via the usual uh, pre-enforcement uh, uh, method. And I wanna uh, just highlight four issues that um, that jumped out at me from, from the argument. First is that there seemed to be two theories floating around on which the plaintiffs could proceed. The theory that they put forward and that the justices didn't reject out of hand was that the federal court could issue an injunction prohibiting state court clerks from accepting the lawsuits, from accepting the uh, SBA suits and docketing them and putting them in the court's file. Um, now, the, the, the complaint had gone, gone after uh, clerks to stop them from docketing the cases and state court judges to stop them from adjudicating. The plaintiffs ran from this idea of stopping judges uh, because there is language in the court's decision in Ex parte Young, the decision that allows for these sorts of pre-enforcement lawsuits against executive officials. But there's language in Ex parte Young um, that says you can sue and enjoin executive officers, you can't sue and enjoin judges, state court judges, to stop them from adjudicating. 
Um, there's no adverseness. They're not executing the law in any meaningful uh, uh, sense of the way that we understand that word. But the courts seem to buy into the argument from the plaintiffs that, well, okay, that's true for judges, but clerks are doing an administrative rather than adjudicative function. They're taking the documents and they are, and they are filing them. Um, and that is something that looks a little bit more like ex uh, more executive. They're not enforcing, but they are allowing the lawsuits to be commenced. They are necessary for a lawsuit to be commenced. So that was the plaintiff's argument, and the justices were mildly receptive to it. The, the other path that to me makes more sense was put forward by Justice Sotomayor and then later echoed by Justices Kagan and Breyer. And they pointed out that in the ordinary criminal case, an ordinary challenge to a criminal, a, a law that's enforced through criminal sanctions, the plaintiff or the rights holder sues the attorney general. And if they get an injunction against the attorney general, that also would stop any individual district attorney from commencing a lawsuit to enforce that statute. And so uh, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Breyer uh, floated this idea idea of, well, sue the attorney general who has some residual enforcement authority. And by getting at him, you are getting at all of the underlings who have their own individualized enforcement authority. So sort of likening any individual SBA plaintiff to a, dis to a district attorney. Um, and that, to me, has the advantage of being a little bit more consistent with how ex parte young and, and pre-enforcement offensive constitutional litigation works. Um, it also depends on an important issue that wasn't really discussed, but that the court would have to resolve, which is that I believe that the structure of SBA by delegating this exclusive author enforcement authority to private individuals makes those private individuals into state actors. It makes them uh, per uh, persons acting under color of law who are subject to suit for constitutional violation. So with that extra step, um, by you treat them more like public officials and it also can limit it to SB8 as a fairly unique statute uh, rather than um, potentially creating mechanisms whereby any tort defendant uh, fearing a state court suit could now run and sue a, uh, could now run and sue uh, the clerk of court. Um, second, there was a lot of focus on the various limitations on state law litigation, on the fact that uh, venue in an SBA at SB8 action can be uh, in it can be anywhere in Texas. That there is no non mutual preclusion from any judgment. Um, that uh, the attorney's fees are one way. An SB8 plaintiff can recover fees if he prevails, but an SB8 defendant cannot recover fees. Um, uh, if, if, if the claim fails. And the implication seemed to be that the way the state court litigation was structured was inherently unfair, was biased in favor of the plaintiff. And that rendered uh, it insufficient that rights holders are able to defend these cases in state court. Um, third, and the thing that was getting a lot of attention uh, in some of the media coverage was the parade of horribles, that this is not limited only to uh, abortion, but states could do the, you know, uh, California, New York could do this with gun rights, and Arkansas could have done this with school segregation or same-sex marriage or religion that any state now could say conduct that is otherwise constitutionally protected is unlawful and any person may sue any other person who engages in that constitutionally um, protected conduct. Um, and, and that, and, and several justices brought up questions, uh, questions like that. 
Um, the problem with that is it really begs the question of whether or not these laws are in fact problematic. Just saying that the law could be reproduced is only a problem if the law that's being reproduced is problematic. The mere fact that it may, that we may see other examples doesn't by itself um, establish anything. Um, and then the fourth thing I would point out is something that Professor Sachs wrote in a blog post at the Vala Conspiracy this morning um, that was really missing from the argument was the complete absence of any suggestion of a limiting principle um, that uh, would allow the court to allow for the offensive litigation that the plaintiffs are trying to pursue here without opening the, the floodgates of, and I hate using that term, so without opening the door to the federal courthouse for any rights holder uh, wanting to challenge a potential enforcement of any law. So uh, is it, it, there's what is it about SB8 that is so different in a way that, in a, in a way that matters that the next time CNN is facing a lawsuit, uh, it won't simply sue the state court clerk and uh, or sue the state court clerk to stop the clerk from accepting the lawsuit and they and therefore get the case into uh, get the case into federal court. Um, and neither the plaintiffs nor the court really seem to identify any such limiting any such limiting principles. So, Reading the tea leaves, I do think the plaintiffs are going to win. I think the big question is going to be the is going to be how the court writes the opinion. Whether this is uh, you know good for one for one ride only, or if the court's going to do some real damage to how constitutional litigation uh, proceeds. So the um, U.S. versus Texas argument um, proceeded somewhat differently. I think the court. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not good at reading tea leaves. I won't hazard any predictions about who's going to win and who's going to lose. But I can say that the court seemed more interested in letting uh, whole women's health win than they did in letting the United States win. Um, so the, uh, the issue that the uh, new Solicitor General, this was her uh, first argument uh, in that position before the court, um, faced was, uh, you know, why exactly does the U.S. get to sue here? And when is it allowed to sue? And so the argument, the, the answers to those in some ways overlapped and her argument was essentially that sort of the US has a sovereign interest in preventing the nullification of federal uh, constitutional law by a state. And that nullification occurs whenever a state is able to choke off the avenues of relief, either uh, pre-enforcement with regard to sort of 1983 or ex parte young by channeling litigation through private actors and also post-enforcement by um, all of these different kinds of uh, sort of stack the deck procedural moves um, such as lack of attorney's fees and so on. Um, and the difficulty that that argument faced is that it seemed to be sort of targeted precisely at um, the various features of SB8. And it was much harder for the Solicitor General to articulate what's the general category of statutes that do this? So sort of how much pressure do you need before one would say federal law has been nullified in Texas? You know, how difficult does it have to be? Um, and the uh, you know, where again, and even Justice Breyer uh, raised this worry is, um, you know, we don't want to say that all tort suits are uh, potential avenues for the United States to sue in equity um, under in redebs um, and to go after judges and court clerks. Um, so if that's not going to be the, the rule, um, not every unconstitutional tort law will trigger this, then, you know, there have to be some additional thresholds and it wasn't entirely clear what the answer was. Um, there's a lot of discussion back and forth on that point. Also a lot of discussion on whether the private individuals who might bring suits under this law really were acting under uh, in, in active concert and participation with the, the state of Texas um, and a disagreement on that point. Um, when Texas's uh, uh, attorney stood up, the uh, issues there were really, um, again, sort of part of the parade of horrible questions, you know, how tough can Texas make it? Can I have a million dollars? Can I have, as, as he suggested, $5 billion penalties and court is on the moon? You know, what is the threshold here for saying that Texas has made it impossible to challenge? And his argument essentially was, look, if there are going to be procedural due process 
challenges to the attorney's fees provision or the issue preclusion provision or court being on the moon, those can be raised, but those weren't the um, issues that were raised here. Um, there were also questions that came up in both uh, of the main parties' arguments about um, what happens if the plaintiffs prevail in whole women's health. So would a victory for the plaintiffs in the whole women's health show that in fact, no special lawsuit is needed here and therefore the US has no case? Um, are, the, are the two claims sort of inversely tied together in that way? Um, there was also an uh, appearance by uh, uh, Jonathan Mitchell for the interveners in the case. Um, these are private individuals who've expressed interest in bringing suits under SB8, but only in circumstances that do not violate Roe and Casey. So um, circumstances that are left out by uh, Roe and Casey, but are nonetheless uh, included in the text of SB8. SB8 has as ironclad a severability clause as law professors know how to write. Um, and so the issue was whether um, an injunction uh, should, as the district courts had, extend to all suits filed under SB8, or whether it should only apply to uh, suits filed under SB8 that would uh, restrict conduct uh, ostensibly protected by Rowan Casey. Um, and uh, the Solicitor General had suggested that the court shouldn't get into the details of trying to figure out what is and isn't um, protected, and the interveners um, of course, argue that the uh, not only that they are not bound by uh, an injunction against the state because they're not acting in active concert or participation, but also that their claims are perfectly lawful and should be allowed to proceed. Great. Uh, well, any responses, Professor Wasserman? Anything you want to go off of, or Professor Sachs? Anything you want to add to the whole women's health discussion? before we go to uh, audience questions? So the one thing that I would say is that, um, and I appreciate Professor Wasserman mentioning um, the, the blog posts, um, the, uh, the difficult issue I see in the whole women's health case is trying to articulate why the court clerks would be an appropriate defendant. Um, you know, the theory of ex parte young is when the prosecutor files a prosecution based on an unconstitutional statute, they are themselves violating the constitution somehow. It's not totally clear to me that that's correct. Um, and therefore that they sort of lose the official character and the protection that sovereign immunity might otherwise confer. Um, I don't know that that argument can be made about the court clerks because when the court clerks stamp a complaint as being received, they are not expressing any judgment whatsoever about the merits of that complaint. Um, they are not sort of standing behind it. They're not adverse to the uh, defendant as, as an opposing party in the way that you could argue that the prosecutor is kind of like an opposing party. I mean, in, in real terms, the state is the opposing party. You know, the state of Minnesota was the opposing party in ex parte young. We couldn't enjoin them because of sovereign immunity. So we let you go after the prosecutor. That's what's generously called the fiction of ex parte young and sometimes might be more of a falsehood. Um, but the idea of uh, it is that the prosecutor is in some sense at fault here. I don't think the court clerks are at fault. And um, it's been, you know, looking at the details of Ex parte Young, you know, the whole machinery of the court system is in some sense outside its scope. And so I, I think it would be a difficult opinion to write. I think it sounds better in oral argument than it would actually in the text of the opinion to explain how the court clerks lose their status as officials because they're violating the constitution. And that's that's really why I, I, I thought both the judges and clerks theory together uh, really makes no sense and just opens the door to a complete change to how uh, constitutional litigation operates. I'm willing to accept uh, uh, that fiction of ex parte young, but the constitutional violation was um, was the filing and the imposition of liability under the suit. And all of that happens because of the executive official who is enforcing the law. The judges aren't doing anything adverse to the, to the plaintiff in adjudicating that, um, and, and neither are the clerks. Um, part of the reason going in, I hoped that the, the United States suit was the 
would be the one that the court would ride with was I thought it could it would allow the court to resolve this case um, as something weird without ultimately doing a huge amount of damage because um, you know in some ways SB8 uh, we wrote was was the perfect storm because you had this really unique mechanism uh, plus exclusive litigation plus the left's uh, uh, darling privilege as somebody, as somebody referred to it. Um, and he, but even if you saw a whole bunch of copycat laws, the United States isn't going to sue over every one of them. It can't because it doesn't have the resources and it won't just because different political and policy preferences are going to guide different, uh, different agencies. So I thought that would be the way to address this one unique problem without causing longer term changes to how constitutional rights are litigated. Well, one more thought, and I don't mean to delay the questions, but um, is that the, the alternative solution of going after the attorney general, I think also has some difficulty because even in a world where the attorney general is standing in for district attorneys, at least they're all state officials and at least they're all plausibly connected in some hierarchy of, of supervision. Um, the private plaintiffs really aren't state officials. Um, you know, even if they are, are allowed to sue without personal injury, they take home $10,000 for their own pockets. It's not for the state treasury. Um, and you can imagine Texas passing a new version of the statute if it didn't want to run the risk of, of these individuals being called private AGs. You could pass a new version of the statute that would limit suits to you know, people who are related to the uh, aborted fetus or people who are, um, you know, within a thousand feet of the abortion clinic when it's performed or people who have expressed their willingness to adopt children, um, you know, when the mother might otherwise choose abortion. And so, you know, you can imagine some class of persons who have a stronger claim of injury here. Um, and if the state, you know, sort of tweaks it a little bit, um, they would very easily get around um, the, the kind of limitation that the, the court would have would already have spent a lot of resources in sort of propping up and trying to make plausible. So actually, uh, if there's nothing more to add here, we can always go back to this discussion. There's a perfect jumping off point. We have a question about um, the form of private enforcement. Have other states tried the same form of private enforcement? Um, I suppose the question is open-ended to anything because the second part of it is, what are the limits on what can be delegated to private enforcement, if there are any limits? This is a theory question, but jumps off your point very well. You want to start or you want me to, or? Well, I mean, the, the first thought that came to mind was an example that, that Professor Wasserman had, had raised earlier, which is Nike v. Kasky, um, which I've, if I remember right, was a suit that gave sort of relatively broad um, enforcement authority to uh, individuals for um, false advertising. Is that is that right? Yeah, it was any person could sue for false advertising, various consumer protection. This was a this was California's law prior to two thousand four. And you know the the uh, criteria that have been uh, assigned, let's put it generously, to Article Three as a matter of, of standing, the requirements of injury in fact, and so on, in the federal courts don't apply to state courts. You know, state constitutional law can be different than federal constitutional law. If they want to have lots of lawsuits by individuals who have no, um, you know, injury of the sort that a federal uh, court would recognize, that's up to them and their legislature and their constitution. Um, so while states tend not to do this, because it's generally not a good idea to let any, you know, random person walk into court and sue about stuff, um, it's hard to say there's any federal constitutional barrier to their doing so. Um, and so it's hard for me to see how a state is prohibited from, uh, you know, giving sort of relatively broad enforcement authority. If it wanted to say anyone in our state can sue if they ever see you littering or something like that. I, I don't know how the federal courts would get in the way. No, I think that's, there was a lot of talk in, in, in uh, particularly in, the, in both arguments, but particularly in the whole women's health argument was this is not, um, this is not a tort claim. You know, sure the state can create, create tort rights, but this is not that, um, but that really, begs the question of what a tort claim is. 
um, and and how much leeway the state has to redefine um, what its what its torts what its torts are. What makes SB eight unique is the exclusivity of the enforcement. So uh, California's um, consumer protection laws they allowed for any person to bring a private suit, but they also retained a mechanism for uh, county attorneys and city municipal attorneys. And and district attorneys uh, uh, to sue to enforce the law, which is missing uh, with re with respect to SB eight. Great. I suppose we might return to the question of uh, whether torts are wrongs or uh, how we should understand them. But anyways, that's a, might be a law school question. Um, we have another question that that goes uh, right to the uh, professor Sachs. Your answer about. What about the limits and well, states, state courts have different um, standards. This person's asking, was there any discussion during argument about how the clerk would uh, reject a complaint and what remedy, if any, a litigant would have if the complaint is rejected? What if the clerk rejects a claim not about SB8 under the guise that it's an SB8 claim? Well, I mean, in general, clerks are not required to review um, you know, the merits of litigation. I mean, there are certain things that they are required to review, you know, matters of form and so on. Um, but, you know, especially if you're in a system of notice pleading that doesn't require naming your cause of action. Um, you know, you can imagine situations would require a great deal of legal thinking to figure out, is this an SB8 claim or not? Um, the, uh, you know, one of the questions asked, what if an SB8 claim is combined with a standard tort or property claim? And the, the, the plaintiff said, well, that would also be barred under their, you know, vision of the injunction. Um, so this would require an awful lot of legal work on the clerk's part. Um, and it would presumably, if they make a mistake and erroneously reject your filing, I don't know what you do. I, I mean, do you seek mandamus? If you do, is that itself barred? Um, you know, are, are you allowed to claim that you're not filing under SB8 if they think you are? Um, so I, you know, I, I think that's one reason why in general, the law doesn't prevent you from filing your lawsuit. They let you in and either punish you afterwards for violating an anti-suit injunction or just say that you lose. Um, but we don't put all the weight on the folks who are supposed to be stamping your papers and getting you into court. Yeah, there also would be an interesting uh, an issue of uh, probably the clerk having to run back to the federal court for the federal court to pass judgment on whether filing this particular suit um, would run afoul would run afoul of the injunction. Um, and it's the 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 clerk would be the excuse me the federal court would be supervising what's going on within the within the state court. Sounds like a very complicated endeavor. Um, okay, we'll go to some of the more uh, general questions we have. The first one is um, Professor Josh Blackman in an op-ed today, I'm not sure if he's on right now, but he might be, and this was not from him, uh, says that the oral arguments suggest Justice Kavanaugh's and Bear, Justices Kavanaugh and Bear, excuse me, have quote, caved to judicial supremacy because Kavanaugh seemed willing to reinterpret Young and Shelley v. Kramer and Barrett seemed concerned that state courts could not grant global relief, i.e. to non-parties. What are your thoughts on Blackman's argument? He's absolutely right. Um, uh, one of the amicus briefs, I think it may have been Jonathan Mitchell's, uh, sort of made a, department, a, a departmentalist point that states, and I think what he meant was state legislatures are free to adopt their own uh, uh, interpretations of the Constitution, and Chief Justice Roberts asked uh, uh, Texas Solicitor General uh, Judd Stone what he thought of that, and Stone ran from it very, very, uh, very, very fast. So um, the the court likes judicial supremacy, obviously, and especially the Supreme Court likes judicial supremacy, um, but they were not going to hear, and Stone gave the only answer he could give, um, they are not going to countenance the idea that a state can, can decide a law is constitutionally valid, enact it, and then see what happens, and if the court disagrees with us, that's, a, that's on the court. 
So the only thing that I would say is um, it is possible to be too pessimistic um, about, you know, what about the, the, the state of the, the court's uh, uh, decision making, though, um, you know, possible, but not all that, all that often, you know, pessimism is usually justified. Um, but uh, my sense is, you know, sometimes people are asking questions, not because they think that X is true, but because X is their biggest worry and they want to sort of hear what you're saying about it. Um, so I, I have given up trying to predict what any justice will do on anything, having, you know, lost a lot of bets. Um, so I, I, I don't make any predictions at this point. Let's go back for a second to the uh, private persons and injunction world that we were just talking about. Um, that, that this person is asking the Chief Justice pressed the United States on whether, to the extent that private persons can file suit, the United States was essentially seeking a quote injunction against the world. Is this a fair characterization? There's a second follow-up question. The solicitor responded that the injunction runs against quote those who actually choose to involve themselves in the constitutional violation by filing suit. Is this a distinction without a difference? Your thoughts. So the Solicitor General's defense was that you don't get hit by the injunction until you, with notice of the injunction, file a lawsuit. Um, and in some sense, that's right, it's not against the world. The problem is it's not really obviously against these plaintiffs either. I mean, the, the active concert and participation language in 65D2 normally doesn't extend to folks who are in this category. I don't think anyone would say, for instance, that plaintiffs who file suit under state law against the state of Texas are in active concert, you know, seeking injunctions against the state of Texas, are in active concert and participation with the state of Texas because they rely on state law in doing so. Um, I think it's a very strange picture of who the state of Texas is for this purpose that would say that those plaintiffs are sort of working with them just because they rely on state law. I think part of the error here is treating the state as it shows up in court as a litigant and the state as a source of law as the same entity. Often Texas, the litigant, will lose on an issue of Texas law. Um, and the only way to make sense of that is to say that the litigant and these sorts of law are two different things. Uh, that when we're talking about Texas law, we're talking about the law created by the sovereign. When we talk about the litigant, we talk about the sort of executive power of Texas that you know, can be ordered to do stuff. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the thought that the plaintiffs are in cahoots with the state, um, I think is a, just a, a little bit sloppy. And moreover, we never in ordinary cases where injunctions are granted against the state, treat state judges and court clerks as already within the scope of 65 D2 when we're trying to construe injunctions. So here the district court specifically included them. So it was very, you know, you wanted to make everyone know that, you know, they're in the, they're in the zone of folks being bound here. Um, but that's an unusual application of 65 D2 because we normally don't think of it as working that way. And yet it operates of its own force to all agents, employees, officers, et cetera. So if normally we don't treat state judges and state court clerks as bound in this way, it's a little hard for me to see why they would be bound in this circumstance and even less so the private plaintiffs. So I think the, so, so a couple of things, I think the private plaintiff's point again relies on uh, the conclusion that what makes SB8 unique or SB8's unique features uh, turn these private plaintiffs into persons acting under color of law. Um, and so now they're a little bit uh, differently situated from the ordinary from the ordinary private plaintiff. Um, and no, that idea didn't really come up in any meaningful discussion in any point of the argument. But I think it's a key feature um, for making either the suit against the suit against the United States or the best solution or the United States suit or the best solution to whole woman's health. Um, uh, it, it's, it's key to sort of making, making both of them work. Um, the, the other thing that, that I think got lost in this, there was a lot of attention paid to who can the court enjoin. And then this goes back to, to, I think, Professor Sachs's point, the, we're, 
paying a lot of attention to who can the court enjoin and ignoring the question of enjoin that person from what. So you can take Texas as the defendant. Fine, we can enjoin Texas, but what can you enjoin Texas from doing? I don't think a federal court could enjoin Texas from enacting a law. I don't think it could enjoin Texas to require it to repeal a law. It's enjoining Texas in its role as enforcer. So it's it's not the who, but rather the what the court is, is stopping. And I should say there have been cases where, you know, municipalities might be ordered to adopt a bylaw of some kind or something like that. Um, you know, it's not entirely clear that those are correct. And moreover, you know, municipalities are not sovereigns. They're more like corporations in that respect. Um, I, I don't know of a case where any sovereign state has ever been ordered to, you know, amend its its legal code in some respect. I would imagine legislative immunity would 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 pre would prescribe that. Well, but I mean, you know, oh, we're proceeding against the state. We're not proceeding against the legislature. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that like you, you can't understand what you're ordering the state to do without thinking about worries of legislative immunity. I don't think naming the state as your defendant gets you out of those problems. Agreed. Okay. Let's stay on uh, SB8 for a second, the features of the bill. Uh, two questions, actually, um, and one just popped up. The first one is what of Kavanaugh's con Justice Kavanaugh's concerns about the retroactivity of uh, SBA? This has been talked about a lot. Um, and the second question is, uh, does this is a uh, textual matter, and, and maybe you don't know it, but um, does SBA permit non-Texas residents to bring an action? I, I believe the answer to the second question is yes. And two of the lawsuits that somebody somebody asked in the chat if any lawsuits have been filed. There have been three that have been filed, and two of them were filed by outsiders. Um, and so I don't think the law could be applied against someone who has an abortion out of state. Um, but there's nothing to the law that stops someone from out of state from uh, from from filing from filing the lawsuit. So the the concern for the about the retroact retroactivity provision was part of the uh, the discussion of all the features of SB8 that. Um, disadvantage plaintiffs, disadvantage defendants in the enforcement actions. And thus were used in a lot of the questions and in Whole Woman's Health's arguments um, to suggest that defensive litigation in state court was not an adequate, was, was not adequate to vindicate their rights uh, compared, and, and therefore they didn't have an adequate remedy at law and they needed to be able to get uh, the injunction in federal court. And so the idea of retroactivity is that the law says that an, a, that an injunction performed while a decision or judgment is allowing for enforcement of the law is making the abortion lawful um, can become retroactively unlawful if there is a change. So when abortion performed in September of 2021, that was lawful because uh, Roe, versus, Roe and Casey are still in place. That becomes unlawful should Roe and Casey be overruled in Dobbs, could then form the basis for a lawsuit three years from now. Uh, similarly, a defendant can face multiple suits on the same, not multiple liability, but multiple suits uh, on the same abortion for performing the same abortion. And so all of those were the, the things that made the state remedy inadequate uh, and, and therefore a basis for uh, demanding injunctive relief in federal court. So two points that I want to raise. First, with respect to non-Texas residents, non-Texas residents could also be defendants. Um, so, you know, Justice yes. Alito presented the example of an out-of-state doctor who flies into Texas and performs an abortion. Um, you could get diversity of citizenship, depending on how the damages work, you might be able to get over 75,000. So you could imagine a case brought in federal court um, under SB8, you know, uh, under Claxon in, in, in Texas, 
um, or indeed perhaps in another state, uh, if their choice of law rules would select Texas law because that's the place where the abortion was performed. And yet you would never think of the United States being an appropriate target of an injunction, uh, much less the federal district court clerk or a federal district judge. Um, nobody seemed to think that that would be appropriate, yet it's not entirely obvious to me why if all state, if all suits under SB8, even the ones that are outside Roe and Casey, uh, might be appropriately uh, the target of an injunction, these wouldn't be uh, either. The other point about retroactivity is this is sort of a subset of just a broader question about what happens if Roe and Casey are overturned. Um, you know, there are a lot of states where the law on the book says that abortion is legal. And there are various injunctions currently in place against the uh, executive officers of those states enforcing the law. Um, if Roe or Casey were overturned, presumably it would be appropriate under Rule 60b-5 or whatever state equivalents to modify those injunctions and rescind them. And then the question is, could you bring a prosecution for an act that was done you know, while Roe and Casey were still on the books and not overruled. Um, that's a much harder question. Um, on the one hand, it seems like something of a bait and switch, tell people that the Supreme Court has recognized a constitutional right, but on the other hand, um, you're getting prosecuted for it anyway. Um, yet the Supreme Court doesn't have a pardon power. They don't actually have the ability to change what's lawful and unlawful um, outside the scope of individual cases within their jurisdiction. Um, they can't tell you um, that, uh, you know, the Constitution now says X if it doesn't. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, the court may have to face those questions if it limits Roe and Casey in any significant way, um, but uh, I don't think they're going to be easy. Staying on this theme for a second, we have another question about uh, SB8. This is Chief Justice Roberts uh, raised the point about SB8 circumventing traditional venue requirements. This might go back to our judicial supremacy uh, discussion or, or whatnot. And I'll actually, I'll refer you to um, a comment that I saw in a Texas article of um, someone was saying, well, the courts, um, the court might be inclined to, uh, quote, protect its own power and slap down attempts to avoid the federal courts. Um, is that the right way to think about this? I mean, it can't be the case that everything belongs in federal courts, right? So continuing on that. Well, the, no, the federal courts might think so, but yeah, no, yeah. I think that's that's absolutely right. I mean, it's it is there. There are a lot of types of cases and categories of cases that are litigated in state court where rights holders assert their their rights defensively. Um, some of those situations are created by the federal courts themselves. Um, for example, younger abstention is the federal court. Um, pushing defendants into uh, in, it, 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 sur surrendering the power um, to do that. So clearly the federal court's ordinary view is not that um, federal courts have to be, federal district courts have to be available um, for, all, uh, for all circumstances. And I think, you know, again, the venue requirements were just one more, SB8 sets all these really weird procedural um, limitations, therefore it's an, it's an inadequate forum, um, which sort of ignores federal law and the federal constitution don't speak to a state's venue requirements. If a state wanted to establish one giant venue for the entire state, um, federal due process doesn't impose any sort of limitations on that. Um, so that was another example of the court saying, well, here's all these weird uh, state features and ignoring the question of, so what? States get to set up their court systems however they want, as long as they comport with sort of basic due process, notice opportunity to be heard, Im impartial decision maker, um, and venue has never been thought to implicate any of those three. I mean, you could imagine a world in which the venue requirement was so onerous as to trigger perhaps a procedural due process objection if they say, you know, the courthouse is located at the bottom of Lake Michigan or something. But, um, you know, short of that, 
the United States <laughs> lets you lay venue in all sorts of weird situations. You know, in bankruptcy law, you can lay venue in really weird places. And um, no one's ever thought that's a Fifth Amendment violation. Um, so the, um, you know, my sense is that if there were objections to the various sort of back end post enforcement barriers to litigation. And, I, and the one I see is really serious is the lack of attorney's fees. So SB8 says that even if the suit against you is entirely frivolous and is intended solely for the purpose of harassment and has no merit whatsoever, you still can't get attorney's fees. Um, it is at least plausible to me that a rule like that is an abridgment of whatever right is being uh, protected, assuming there is such a right. So if we said, um, you know, you can, you know, no, no attorney, you can get attorney's fees for any other frivolous law, any other frivolous suit, but not if it um, involves speech critical of the mayor. You know, I think that I think that that would be a First Amendment problem. Um, but, uh, you know, you would litigate that in the individual suit, you would ask for attorney's fees, the court might say no, SB8 forbids them, you would say that's unconstitutional, because First Amendment, and then you would have that fight. Um, and it would go up to the Supreme Court eventually. So, you know, it, it strikes me that the, the various back end worries about venue, about non-mutual issue preclusion, which frankly is itself of relatively recent vintage, um, you know, about, uh, um, you know, the, the whether SB8 gives enough of an undue burden exception as an affirmative defense, you know, all of those things can be litigated defensively in individual lawsuits. And it's not clear to me without Congress having acted yet that either the US or the private plaintiffs um, have a legal argument to stand on in, in critiquing them uh, offensively. Oh, I guess I was muted there. Um, okay, our next question is about, um, let's see, did any of the justices ask why the abortionists could not raise their constitutional defenses in any state court litigation? If so, what was the response? I suppose to put a fine point on it, Professor Sachs, going back to your last point, what's the right here? Is it the right of the abortionist to perform the abortion or is it a different, is it the right of the woman? Well, well so the there, there are two things to separate out here. One is the third party standing question. Um, some justices have been uh, friendly to the argument that a person who performs an abortion cannot raise the right, uh, if any, of the uh, uh, woman to receive that abortion as a defense. I, I think that's a little strange. Um, normally, we say that if you're getting criminally prosecuted, you can argue that the law under which you're prosecuted is unconstitutional. That's available to you uh, as, as an argument. I mean, either it's either the law is is in place or it isn't. And presumably the legal system has to have some opinion on that. Um, so that, that's one issue. And, and that too would be litigated in the individual lawsuits as they're brought. Um, but then more generally, you know, the, the concern was, um, you know, is there so much of a chilling effect here with, you know, such enormous penalties? You could imagine a statute with a million dollars of damages um, and so many barriers to its enforcement that back end defensive litigation is really not a viable option. And I think one thing that's important is that the court did not seem at all interested in a, a official proclamation that you have a constitutional right to pre-enforcement review. Um, maybe that was sort of a presupposition or sort of an idea that this is the normal course that ran through a lot of the court's questioning, but nobody seemed willing to just go on record and say, you always have a right to pre-enforcement review and either it comes through ex parte young or it comes through this. Um, maybe that's the import of, of you know, some of the justices' positions, but they didn't seem to be adopting it formally. I don't know if Professor Wasserman has a different thought on that. No, I, I agree with that. I think that was that was definitely the background assumption of, of a lot of these questions. And it was federal pre-enforcement is the norm unless it looks like the state proceeding is okay, but look at all the things that are wrong with the state proceeding. And so now we need federal enforcement and the problem with SB, federal pre-enforcement review and the problem with SB8 is that it cuts it off. But I don't think they were willing to, I don't think they were willing to write an opinion that says that. No, and, and, and I think it goes back to, it, it goes back to, I think some of the things that, that, that you've written in the blog post, and I think that, that some of the commentary has, has reflected, 
even if the prevailing view is right that um, that whole woman's health is going is going to win, um, you know, and that's what, what people are saying reading the tea leaves. Uh, it's a uh, it's a really hard opinion to write right now because because either they're going to have to address all of these background presumptions or they're going to ignore them and that's going to throw everything into disarray. So one one thing I want to add real quick, and this might be responsive to some of the questions that are out there. I, I'm really curious about the timing. Um, so the court granted cert before judgment, which is pretty unusual. It expedited the oral argument enormously. It's like the fastest oral argument since Bush v. Gore, I think. Um, I have no idea when they're going to render a decision, but that seems very important because if they're actually revisiting Roe and Casey and Dobbs, as you know, seems to be the case, um, if it turns out that there is no uh, constitutional right to abortion in the circumstances where Texas has proscribed it, um, it seems like this case is moot. Um, it seems like there's nothing to talk about here. Who cares whether the United States can sue if we know that they're going to lose? Um, and so. I wonder whether the court will feel some need to sort of render an answer that will only be interesting for a little while before it gets to Dobbs, which is gonna be argued in less than a month now, um, or whether the process of trying to write this opinion will take long enough that it'll run into Dobbs and then they'll have to hold it until June or something. Yeah, I think they're going to decide this before the month is out. I think they want this case disposed of, whether for optics or or some other reason. Because I, 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 you're right that I'm not sure what the practical effect is, um, but I think they want this case out of the way um, when they decide Dobbs, and then they can leave it to the lower courts to decide um, what to do about um, to what to do about about this law. Um, depending on how they resolve Dobbs, or maybe it gets fast tracked back through the uh, back through the, the 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 state system so quickly, and it's back to the court this term. And some people have suggested that um, uh, the compromise the court may find is to. Uh, declare the 15 week ban in Dobbs valid, declare this invalid. So they haven't overturned Rowan Casey. They've just pushed the, the line back by, you know, some number of weeks, but not all the way back to six weeks. I, I think that too would be a hard opinion to write. I mean, yes. I, I, I think, so, so let me, let me venture a hypothesis. It takes four votes to grant cert. I have no idea whether it also takes four to grant cert before judgment, but some people have said that it does. Um, in that case, there might be one of these strange sort of vote cycles where you had four justices who really wanted to hear this case fast, but you might not have five who want to decide it fast, um, in which case you might get something strange happening where sort of they were definitely going to argue it. If they're going to argue it, they might hear it. They might as well hear it now. Um, but it's not necessarily clear that there will be a five justice majority for deciding it pre-Dobbs. I, I just don't know. Well, we have about three minutes left, so we'll get one more question and it's a great way to end. Um, would you be able to comment on probable next steps for each side, depending on who wins? And maybe we touched on this in terms of, well, it might be moot, but let's say that it's not. So I guess I'd say with whole woman's health, if it, uh, if the, the court says that they've got proper defendants, it goes back to the district court uh, to rule on a pending motion for a, it, it doesn't go back to the fifth circuit, it'll go back to the district court to rule on a, a class certification of a defendant class of judges and clerks, uh, and then uh, to rule on a preliminary injunction we pretty much know how the preliminary injunction is going to come out because the courts already ruled on the preliminary injunction in U.S. v. Texas that uh, that the law is constitutionally invalid, and then that will be immediately appealed to the Fifth Circuit. And, and if the U.S. prevails, um, that would, I think, affirm the preliminary injunction issue. Well, no, because it's on the Q, the QP is limited to the question of may the U.S. sue. So then it would go back to the Fifth Circuit. 
which would then have to decide um, now that it knows that the U.S. can sue, what should it do about this about this appeal of a preliminary injunction? Um, and presumably that would mean a, a, an affirmance of the preliminary injunction so long as Roe and Casey are on the books. Um, but uh, I don't know if there are any other, in, you know, preliminary injunction factors that might throw a, a wrench in the gears. Well, terrific. We're out of time this afternoon, but I want to thank you both, uh, Professors Wasserman and Sachs, very much for taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, talk about this case with us, especially day after uh, arguments. So we really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, thanks to our audience for calling in for your great questions, great engagement. Apologies that we didn't get to uh, we didn't get to all of them. There were many, many questions. Um, perhaps we'll revisit this uh, when a decision is rendered, if it is rendered, and if it's rendered soon. But uh, until next time, thank you very much for joining us. We are adjourned.